Hello, and welcome to Philosophy 155A, Lecture 2. This lecture is on abortion. It was the first of a few lectures on abortion, and it concerns the first half, so to speak, of the paper by Marquis, which is called Why Abortion is Immoral. So this paper by Marquis is a good one to start with in a class like ours. This is because I imagine, from having taught this class once before, that for at least some of you, this will be your first philosophy class. And so it is important to read things that are relatively well written. Obviously, this paper is going to be controversial because it deals with an important topic and takes a strong position. Moreover, it takes a strong position, which I imagine a lot of you will be inclined to disagree with. But even if you disagree with it, there's a lot that you can learn from the way that this paper is written. I don't think every philosophy paper needs to be quite this clear. And sometimes when someone is this clear, they lose other things, like style. But this is a well-written paper. And so if you want to understand what it looks like to write a paper that is clear and communicates your point well, so that the person reading your paper can focus their attention not so much on just trying to understand what you're saying, but more importantly, on whether what you're saying is true, which involves coming up with lots of objections, counterexamples, thinking out loud, engaging with what's in front of you, so that the person reading can do that. With more of the time they spend thinking about your paper, and devote less of their time trying to figure out what it is that you're saying. Okay, this is what you want to aim for in the beginning. When you're writing papers in philosophy or in any discipline, you might want at the very beginning to try to write like your favorite writers if you have them. If you've taken philosophy classes, maybe when you were in high school or maybe you're an upper year undergraduate, and so you've seen philosophy papers before, and you have people that you admire, that you want to be like in some ways if you want to be a philosopher. In some cases, what people do when they are writing unclearly is a necessary and lamentable side effect, lamentable side effect of the fact that they're trying to express something difficult. But sometimes it's intentional and as philosophers, I don't think that we should accept that because I think that the matters that we're talking about are often way too important to be hidden in language that's too difficult. So one of the things that I think it's important to understand if you are interested in philosophy and you want to write a good philosophy paper is that when you start, you want to do something similar to what I imagine most painters and visual artists still do these days. And that's that you don't start out with the abstract painting. You don't start out with the really highly stylized painting. You start out being a realist and you try your best to communicate a simple form that's in front of you and you aim above all at clarity and ease of understanding. When you get good as a painter, that's when you want to have a style and you can sort of loosen some of the strict rules that are really important to your development in the earlier stages. But like it or not, I imagine that almost all of you are in the stage of someone who's entering an art school and is learning to paint you need to focus first on realism. And the realism in this analogy means clarity. Wherever you go after, 
It's not going to be good philosophy unless you master this stage first. This paper, even if you disagree with it, even if you think that abortion is not a topic that interests you or that is worth taking seriously, it gets an awful lot of attention. And so I myself don't actually love teaching it because I think people talk about it a lot. But this paper is clear and easy to understand. And so it's a great place to start. And even if you learn nothing else, you can learn an awful lot about how, at the first stages anyway, you should be trying to write a philosophy paper. Maybe if you get good at realism and simplicity, you can open up your style a bit more and not follow such a template, not always allow your reader to know exactly what you're doing at every moment. But staying at that level in philosophy isn't necessarily a bad thing. Because in philosophy, we're trying to communicate ideas that are often new and often very abstract. And even when all we're trying to do is be as clear as possible, we often end up not being clear. This is another reason why studying this paper can help us. Because we can see, I think, when we look at how Marquis writes, that he's trying very hard to be clear. But even so, there are certain ambiguities. And those are unintentional, usually, when an author like Marquis does them. So long story short, and I didn't intend to open this lecture with a sort of methodology on how you ought to be approaching the writing of philosophical papers. But the moral of what I've just said is that ultimately, if you're really writing about something complicated and difficult, you don't need to try to introduce obscurity and ambiguity because that's going to make you sound more intelligent and more mysterious. And I do think some people do write this way for this reason. If you're really talking about something difficult, the obscurity and the air of paradox even, <laughs> it will come from your subject matter. And you don't need to try to put it there because it will come and you will, in fact, if you're really interested in being a philosopher and really communicating your ideas, you will spend your whole life trying to eliminate the ambiguities from your claims because other people will say, did you mean this? And you will say, wait a second, I didn't communicate what I thought I was communicating. And then people will say, well, maybe you meant this. And again, you're going to spend a lot of time, if you're seriously interested in communicating your ideas, in trying to be as clear as possible. The ambiguity will be there. So I say this because it's really important that you learn to write, if nothing else, from this class. And sometimes it can feel like you're sounding intelligent if you are deliberately obscure and ambiguous. Really developed intellectuals, people who've worked a lot on their thinking, and people who have a serious interest in getting things right, they don't need to try to be obscure or to try to be intelligent or to try to confuse people. They will confuse people because what they're talking about is so damn difficult. Okay, that was my little introduction. Let's turn right to the paper. So I have stressed so far the extent to which this is a great paper to read because it is a model of a certain kind of philosophical clarity. Here's what I mean. I say thesis statement above this first paragraph from Marquis' essay. And it's wonderful because I can say that unequivocally. This is a clear thesis. The view that abortion is, with rare exceptions, seriously immoral, has received little support in the recent philosophical literature. 
No doubt most philosophers affiliated with secular institutions of higher education believe that the anti-abortion position is either a symptom of irrational religious dogma or a conclusion generated by seriously confused philosophical argument. The purpose of this essay is to undermine this general belief. This essay sets out an argument that purports to show, as well as any argument in ethics can show, that abortion is, except possibly in rare cases, seriously immoral that it is in the same moral category as killing an innocent adult human being. So that's our thesis statement. Before I go to the next slide, I want you to think for about 20 seconds. What is the thesis here? I want you to think, and I will actually just wait some period of time between 15 and 25 seconds so that you have to do this. If you try to skip ahead, you don't know exactly when I'm coming back. Go ahead. What is the thesis? You're looking for the main claim that's being made here. What is he going to argue for? Okay. This essay sets out an argument that purports to show, as well as any argument in ethics can show, that abortion is, except possibly in rare cases, seriously immoral. That it is in the same moral category as killing an innocent human being. That is what this essay is going to do. And even though it's not terribly exciting or novel or creative, this sentence that I just read is very clear. It tells us exactly what's going to happen. I think that this can get boring very quickly, and in many cases, as a matter of style, I think when you get good at writing, when you're better than you are when you start, at any rate, you can start affording yourself the privilege of not saying things like this essay sets out an argument that, because it's better to do that in a way that's elegant sometimes. But it has a virtue, right? You know exactly what this essay is going to do. It sets out an argument that purports to show, as well as any argument in ethics can show, that abortion is, except possibly in rare cases, seriously immoral. That it is in the same moral category as killing an innocent adult human being. So, we're going to undermine a general belief. What is that? Well, we have to look at the word this, right? And that tells us a rule that we need to go up to the sentence before to find out what's being talked about. This general belief... It looks like the belief here is the belief that irrational religious dogma or a conclusion generated by seriously confused philosophical argument is the reason that people argue against abortion. Okay? So he's going to, first of all, try to undermine a general belief that he believes is fairly prevalent in universities, in recent philosophical literature, among the people who are writing and speaking about this, he thinks that they tend to believe in secular institutions, right, in places where the school is not run by a church, they tend to believe that people that take an anti-abortion position do so because they're sick. He says a symptom, right? A symptom is something that you get when you're sick a symptom of irrational religious dogma, or a conclusion generated by a seriously confused philosophical argument. Okay? So a lot of times he's saying that he's experienced a certain attitude among people in universities that are secular, that are not religious, and that's that people in those institutions tend to think that the anti-abortion position is one generated by irrational religious dogma or a seriously confused argument. Usually both, 
because usually if someone is willing to accept a confused philosophical argument, that they are willing to engage in what we might call motivated reasoning. They're making epistemic failures, failures that have to do with the right way to assess evidence, to ask questions, to look for evidence, and so on. And I think one of the benefits, maybe, of the current culture that we are in now with the internet and social media and Reddit and just the prevalence of arguments among people, one of the benefits of that, if there are any, are that we probably all are more aware than we would have been 15 years ago when I was closer to your age. We're probably more aware now of the fact that people do this a lot. People very often have a position and this influences their ability to think about the facts, the evidence, to ask the right questions, to be responsible if their number one aim is trying to find what is true. So. In most cases, therefore, if somebody does hold an argument on the basis of a religious belief, say, especially if that's an irrational religious belief, a religious belief that it doesn't make sense to have, in most cases when people hold a certain conclusion on that basis, they often are going to be willing to accept a seriously confused philosophical argument for the conclusion. Because right? they're holding it on the basis of something other than what you would do if you wanted to figure out what was true. Given certain reasonable methodological rules you know, that apply to many of the cases, like look at scientific evidence, look at controlled studies, and so on. Anyway... This is the way, according to Marquis, many people in secular institutions of higher education view the position that abortion is immoral, seriously immoral in many cases. Marquis tells us he is going to undermine that belief. He thinks it's wrong and he wants us to agree. So he's going to provide evidence that in fact, this belief is not always the result of confused philosophical argument and religious dogma. Now, when I say he's going to provide evidence, I don't mean that he's going to provide a direct discussion of this per se, right? Sometimes the evidence for the claim you are making doesn't need to be an argument, sometimes just demonstrating is good enough. And that's in fact what Marquis is going to do, right? He's going to undermine this general belief by showing that in fact someone can have an anti-abortion position, the, the view being that abortion is seriously immoral, without doing that because of religious reasons, and without doing that on the basis of a seriously confused philosophical argument. So Marquis wants to show us that not everyone who holds this position has a bad argument for it. He wants to do that by giving us a good one, in a manner of speaking, which hopefully is the aim ultimately of all philosophical papers, right? To give a good argument. But I think it works, sorry, it makes sense for him to say this here because it's also something that a paper like this can accomplish. So he's going to show us that not everyone who holds an anti-abortion position does so because they have a prior religious commitment or because they have a bad argument that they've accepted. He's going to do that by showing, he says, as well as any arguments can show, that abortion is, except possibly in rare cases, seriously immoral. And then, in case we don't know what it means for something to be seriously immoral, 
he gives us a clear example of that that we're all going to be familiar with, that it is in the same moral category as killing an innocent adult human being. So his thesis and his purpose, I think, are different. Right? So his thesis here is that abortion is, except possibly in rare cases, seriously immoral. His purpose is to get us to believe his thesis, of course, but also, hopefully, to use his paper to show us that the ideas that he believes are prevalent about how good anti-abortion arguments tend to be, those ideas are wrong. Notice that he immediately follows up his claim that abortion is seriously immoral with a great example of what that means. He doesn't choose an example that people aren't going to have any strong feelings about. We all agree that killing an innocent adult human being is wrong, is seriously immoral. And when we hear that case, we know what it means to say that something is seriously immoral. Okay? Because we have a strong reaction to the thought of killing an innocent adult human being. He's basically saying, the way you feel about that, that's how I'm saying you should feel about abortion. Okay? And he's going to try to show us, in an argument, that we should feel that way. That the balance of reasons we have for thinking and feeling certain things should, in fact, favor our feeling that way and thinking those things. Now, one of the things that I want to point out, just again, to try to show you how to read papers, I kind of talk a lot about how you write them. When you're reading something like this, and you're doing it as a philosopher, the way that you read makes you be able to write your paper later. What I mean is, don't think that you start writing your paper when your paper is assigned. You start work on your papers when you're reading. Because you need to read actively, which means asking yourself lots of questions, and in some cases, writing them in the margins, if that helps you remember, and of course it does. So reading actively can mean that you write all over your book. You know, you don't just write bad words. <laughs> you can write some, but you write questions. So the view that abortion is, with rare exceptions, seriously immoral, you want to ask in your head, well, what does he mean? What rare exceptions? What do you think? What would be an exception? So an exception here is probably going to include cases like pregnancy as a result of rape. Probably will also include cases where the abortion has to be performed or else the mother will or might die. And so on. If you don't know what a secular institution is, and you're reading this for the first time, you should look it up, okay? And it would help you to write the definition of the word in the margin so that you remember it when you're writing. It might seem like, well, that's an awful lot of work, but you have to do the work anyway if you're going to write a paper well. So you should just do it while you're reading. So that's enough to say about this. Just to be clear, in a sort of more organized way, what am I saying? What are the main takeaways? Abortion is, in most cases, seriously immoral. Seriously immoral is defined by example. By being seriously immoral, Abortion is an action in the same category as killing another adult human being. Now, 
I want you to notice also, because definitions are of tremendous importance when we're writing philosophy, it's very important to define what we mean. Because it's so important to be clear and give clear definitions, we also need to ask ourselves in many cases, what's the most appropriate way to give the definition in this particular case? Now, in many instances, the most appropriate way to give a definition is going to be to give an abstract description that means the same thing as the word you're trying to define. So, for example, if I were trying to define something that people might not know any examples of, maybe something that's especially technical, I probably do need to give one of these kinds of definitions. On the other hand, if there are cases where what we are trying to define can be fairly clearly communicated by just giving an example that people are very likely to know, that can be a better way to define something. Often a good definition will use both. But when I write questions for classes, I very often specify, and many of your professors I'm sure you have seen ha will do this, we will very often put with examples. And this is a good place to put an example when you're defining. Okay, You can see here why. Because we might not have understood exactly how serious, seriously immoral is. But now he's given us an example. And as I stressed on the previous slide, his purpose is different than his thesis because his purpose is more than just getting us to believe that his argument is plausible or persuasive or not at least irrational. There are no obvious fallacies, mistakes in it. He also wants to prove to us, as one of his principal purposes, that you can give a good argument for this position. Lastly, there are instances where a particular act of abortion is not seriously immoral and where abortion may be morally permissible or perhaps even morally obligatory. What I'm saying here, and this is not a major part of his thesis and it's not something he wants to talk about here, and he's given us an indication of that in the first slide, it's nevertheless true that he strongly suggests that he believes that there are going to be cases where a particular act of abortion is, all things considered, not seriously immoral. It might be, and I say there's two options here, it might be that it's morally permissible, meaning getting the abortion for some other reason is okay. So even though it's normally seriously immoral, in this case, there's something else going on that kind of tips the scale so that this thing either actually has nothing wrong with it, or it has something wrong with it, but there's something else that overrules it and makes it either okay to do, permissible, or obligatory. You have to do it. He says, though, in most cases, it is seriously immoral. Okay? So there's lots of options, if we think about it, in the general vague things he has said about the possibility that sometimes abortion is not seriously immoral. Right? There's two big ones to think about. It might be that in some cases of abortion, the thing that makes abortion wrong normally just isn't there. Okay? So if, for example, what makes abortion wrong normally is that the fetus could develop into a living being, and in a particular case, we know for sure that the fetus, even if it is born, is going to die immediately. Well, if what normally makes abortion wrong is that the living thing that we are killing is going to have 
a future life that is longer than a couple of days, then in this case, abortion would still be abortion. You're still doing what abortion is, killing an unborn. But it wouldn't be immoral because the reason, whatever it is that makes the normal abortion immoral, is missing. It could also be, though, that the thing that normally makes abortion wrong is there, okay? So whatever it is that makes killing a unborn fetus or child, I don't like to say either because that already starts giving a certain position based on the words you're choosing. Um, if it's the case that that is there, it can still be that abortion is not seriously immoral because there might be something else that you can only avoid that would be seriously immoral by having the abortion. Like maybe bringing a child into the world that is the result of a rape is seriously immoral. Okay, Maybe it's wrong because... Nobody, nobody cares, Siri. I said seriously. So maybe it's wrong because you are taking away a future from a living thing that could have expected to have a fairly long future, longer than a couple days. But maybe the fact that this child would have been the result of rape, allowing that child to come and be a person in the world is seriously immoral. I'm going to have to say profoundly from now on. So there are two options here, right? I just want to flag them because they'll be important later. One of them is that there can be cases where whatever it is that normally makes abortion profoundly immoral, that thing isn't there. Or there can be cases where that thing still is there, but there are other considerations that actually make the thing that would normally be wrong to do, the thing that you maybe can do, that's what it is to say it's morally permissible, permissible, or the thing that you have to do. Okay? In most cases, though, it's seriously immoral. Profoundly immoral. Okay. So Marquis is helpful to us as a writer because he also informs us that his paper is going to be resting on a major assumption that is not argued for in the paper itself. That major assumption is the moral possibility of abortion depends on whether or not a fetus is the sort of being whose life it is seriously wrong to end. Okay, so he's telling us he's going to assume this in what he argues, but he's not going to argue for it. Okay, This is actually something else if you are starting to write a philosophy paper, especially for the first time, but I imagine that you're not doing this so explicitly even if you've written others. Maybe you are. It can be helpful when you're writing out what your view is going to be to ask yourself, what assumptions am I making? Okay, If my view is right, what other things have to be true that maybe I'm not arguing for and maybe I haven't even thought about? Because if there are enough of those that really don't make sense to believe, then your argument is not good, right? And if there are only a few such assumptions that you're not arguing for and could not be argued for, then your paper might be good. So anyway, I'm giving, by the way, what's called uh, a necessary but not a sufficient condition. We're going to get to that on another slide. But in many cases, it can be necessary for your paper to be a good one that there aren't too many things that are being sort of assumed by your argument, aren't being argued for, and most importantly, are not really plausible. They're not things that people are going to believe, and maybe people might, but only if you gave them the argument that's missing. So Marquis is going to argue that the fetus, a fetus is the sort of being whose life it is seriously wrong to end. Okay? Given what a fetus is, it would, it's wrong to end the life of that, to kill it. And what is he not going to argue? 
he's not going to argue that the morality of abortion depends on this claim. He's going to assume that, but he's not going to argue for that. Think for a second about what it is that this might mean. What would it mean to say that a fetus is the kind of being whose life it is seriously wrong to end, but to deny that the morality of abortion depends on this particular claim? Well, it would mean that even though you agreed that the fetus is the sort of being whose life it is seriously wrong to end, you wouldn't think that that was the only thing that was going on. You would think that there would be other things going on that don't have to do with whether a fetus is the sort of being whose life it is seriously wrong to end. And you would have to think that the morality of abortion, whether it's okay or not, is going to depend on those things more often than it does on the question of whether or not it's wrong to kill a fetus. What kinds of things might those be? Well, it might be that having an abortion can give an individual far more autonomy in their lives, and in particular, can release women from the need to be mothers when they don't want to. And so, it might be that this fact gives enough, brings enough value into the world, the ability of someone to make their own choices about what they're going to do with their life, maybe that is significant enough that that actually decides the question, right? That would be the kind of thing that he's not going to argue. He's saying here that he's not going to argue it because he says most other writers, many other writers, he doesn't tell us what percentage. I've actually filled in the many here. What he does, if we look at the paper, is give examples of people he thinks have written good papers on this, okay? And I guess we either assume that those papers are good or not, but if we do, then we probably think that Marquis is in good company when he makes this assumption. Because he thinks most writers that are writing well about this anyway are making this assumption. So they're assuming that whether or not abortion is right, wrong, okay, depends on what you're doing to the thing that's being aborted, whatever that thing may be. There might be other factors that are relevant and maybe might, if we're imagining that this is a, a scale that might tip the balance in favor of abortion being okay or maybe even something you should do, but he thinks that most authors even if they think that there are those important values that abortion can help us realize, or most argues, sorry, authors he thinks should be taken seriously, and that's a big proviso, right? Because we may agree that those authors ought to be taken seriously, or we might not. But at any rate, he thinks enough people argue, sorry, assume this without defending it. He's not going to do it. Now, it can be important for people to know what it is that you're assuming, okay? If you really want people to understand your argument and you're really not just trying to trick them, you want to be forthcoming if you think there's something you're assuming that you're not going to argue for and you want to be honest about that. And if you can say a little bit about why you don't think you should have to prove that in the current paper, do that, okay? Because Students often, and, and I'm really trying to use this first paper as a way to talk about writing as well, students often make mistakes that come from not thinking enough about what it is that needs to be said for them to communicate their argument and what you can safely avoid saying. And there are many assumptions that ultimately you would need to argue for for someone to completely accept your view. 
but you don't need to argue for them in this particular paper or presentation. And that's because you don't have to argue for everything everywhere. You can't. And one of the best things to learn, it's really a skill, is where to draw that line between things you actually need to talk about and things you can say, I'm not going to talk about it, but complete account would need one. Or things you can say, I'm not going to talk about this because it's so obvious. Here, he's not saying it's obvious, but he's saying a lot of people make it. The assumption being, again, that ultimately, whether it's right or wrong to have an abortion is a question that's mostly a matter of whether it's wrong to kill the fetus or entirely a matter. Marquis also points out, very perspicuous about this fact, that there are going to be things that are important to his topic that we would want to have answers to that he's not going to discuss. He says a complete ethics of abortion needs to include accounts of cases where abortion may be morally permissible. In the remainder of the slide, I just give some possibilities that are probably on his mind, and I give the methodological point that I just made that you don't need to argue for any, everything in every paper, and sometimes you can indicate that you're leaving something out. So, the next question we're going to have if we're reading Marquis' paper is why is killing wrong? So if you notice what he's done so far, he's gone from his thesis to telling us his thesis. Now he's moving directly to the question that everyone who's heard his thesis and understood it probably wants an answer to. And that would be why is killing wrong? Because if you think about what he's told us so far, it's that he does think he has a good argument that abortion is wrong. And he also thinks that the reason abortion is wrong has something to do with what we are doing to the fetus. And that is killing I think even on the most neutral reconstruction of the, of the our debate, right? When we're, when we're having debates, it's often difficult to have them because our choice of words can actually dictate to a large extent what arguments we accept. You're killing. You're taking something that has life and you are killing it, right? That's what abortion is. What I want uh, is to stress that non-controversially, this is a case of killing, I think. I think he's on good ground there. You might agree or disagree. Maybe that's something you could write about. So we want to know what it is that makes killing wrong. He tells us that this is a necessary condition on resolving the moral status of abortion. A necessary condition on resolving the moral status of abortion is a theoretical account of the wrongness of killing in those cases where it is agreed to be wrong. So remember, he's assuming that the thing that makes abortion wrong, okay, or maybe obligatory if it ever is, that's going to have something to do with what we are doing to the fetus. That is killing. We're ending a life. It might be that ending that life is required. Right? There are going to be cases in this class where I think the thing to think, and the thing that you might think, is that killing is required. That the right thing to do in this case is to kill. So, it's okay uh, to use that language, because sometimes it can be bad to use language that hides the point. What you don't want to do in a philosophy paper, and I think most of you know this, is use words like murder that are going to presuppose a certain conclusion. Murder is a crime, and so if you're saying something's murder, that's saying that it ought to be illegal. And you need to argue for that, usually, if you're going to say it. We're not just going to let it pass, right, as readers, nor should we. So. I hope I'm not going too slowly, but I really hope that I can help you write as well as understand what the content is and think about it. So we want to understand whether it's wrong to kill a fetus, to have an abortion, to get an abortion. 
He's saying a necessary condition of understanding that, whether it's wrong or not, is that we understand why it's wrong when it is. Why killing is wrong when it is. He says here it's a necessary condition. What does that mean? Well, this is a very common thing to hear in philosophy. A necessary condition, you usually hear this word along with a sufficient condition. These two things go together. A necessary condition is necessary. I say it's an entity, state, or event that needs to be present for something else to be present. I didn't know how to put this so well. Completing all coursework is a necessary condition for passing a class. One way to understand a necessary condition is no y unless x. All right, so I say here, completing all coursework is a necessary condition for passing a class. That means unless you do that, unless you complete all coursework, unless that event happens, or being in the state of having completed it, that has to happen if you're going to pass the class. No passing the class, no y, unless x, unless you complete all the coursework. That's necessary. Now, a necessary condition is not the same thing as a sufficient condition. A sufficient condition is an entity, state, or event whose existence or occurrence guarantees the existence or occurrence of something else. Here the example is completing all coursework satisfactorily is a sufficient condition for passing a class. All I have done here is add the word satisfactorily, the adjective satisfactorily, and now I have a sufficient condition, arguably. A sufficient condition says, if x, then y. So if you complete all coursework satisfactorily, then y, then you pass the class. Now a sufficient condition, you can see, is obviously stronger. A necessary condition is needed. A sufficient condition gets you all the way there. The question is, though, if something is a sufficient condition for something else, does that always mean it's more important? So if something is a sufficient condition for something else, does that mean it's correct to say that that makes it more important than something that would only be a necessary condition? What do you think? The answer here is no, because there are going to be cases where something is a sufficient condition for something else, but there are other sufficient conditions for that same thing. And that more than one thing can get you all the way there. And if that's the case, then it's not really correct to say that either a necessary or a sufficient condition is more important. A sufficient condition can be unnecessary, just as a necessary condition can be insufficient. Right. So getting oxygen every day is a necessary condition for a happy life. But it doesn't mean that you're going to be happy. You need a lot more than that, unfortunately, in life to feel happy. There can be other things that the description is actually enough um, to get you happiness. But maybe that particular thing, that particular description, is only one way to be happy. Those things, are they more or less important? The question doesn't really make sense, does it? I've gone through this important stuff because this is, it's important to understand not only what this distinction is, but why we care. Okay? We care because these two things can be more or less important depending on the situation we're talking about. And we need to know what, which one we're saying. So to make the point Marquis wants to make about his argument, Marquis is saying, therefore, that we need to understand what is wrong with killing in uncontroversial court cases in order to have any hope of understanding the morality of abortion. Understanding what is wrong with killing in uncontroversial cases, though, may not be enough. Okay, it's not sufficient. It's necessary, though. You can't understand whether abortion is immoral without understanding what makes killing wrong in cases that are agreed to be wrong.
So what are we doing here? We're starting with uncontroversial cases, aren't we? Why is that? Marquis wants to examine the morality of abortion. He thinks that abortion uncontroversially involves killing a living being, and it does, but its moral status is controversial. Therefore, if we can figure out what is wrong with killing a living being in cases where this is uncontroversially wrong, we can perhaps say something clear and uncontroversial about the morality of abortion. So, if there are cases that are obviously wrong or obviously right, it can be a good strategy to start by talking about those, figuring out what makes them wrong or right, and then taking that principle and applying it to a new situation. It's almost like I don't play video games. I did when I was very, when I was young. But um, there are cases where I know that there, there are games where, you know, you have to go to like an easy level and get points or get a weapon or something and then you take that weapon and you use it on the hard level and you could have got it on the hard level but it's too hard that's what this is okay you are trying to go into an easy uh you know place and you're gonna take what you need from that and then go to the you know the boss and fight the boss or whatever so we're, we're looking here at what is wrong with killing a living being in cases where we all think that's wrong. Because if we all think it's wrong, then he's not going to need to argue that it is wrong. We'll accept it. And if we all think it's wrong, that's good evidence that maybe it is wrong. People can be wrong about matters of morality. Maybe the fact that all of us believe it doesn't mean that's right. But it's a pretty good piece of evidence. We should believe it's right if we all believe it's right. So one of the advantages also of starting with something that we all agree is right is that maybe it is right. Maybe our judgment here is right. And then whatever it is that makes something right or wrong, well, it's going to be present in this case in the way that we expected it to be there. because. In this case, we're actually looking at, at a case where there is something that's wrong. Once we have figured this out, as I said, we can go to the case that is controversial, that we don't agree about, and maybe that we don't know the actual moral status of. And we'll see whether that case has the features that made the first case that was uncontroversial wrong. So to understand what's happening here, one way to say what we're doing when we do this is that we are establishing general principles. And to give you another case where something like this is going on so that you can see what we're saying, let's say we want to demonstrate that it's wrong to deny individuals employment because of their sexual orientation or gender identity. Okay. I believe this is wrong. I'm going to demonstrate it. How do I do it? Well, one way to start it is by looking at other cases that seem analogous, seem like they share features that are important. It's clearly wrong to deny individuals employment on the basis of their race. Why is that wrong? Right? If we have more people that we are arguing with that believe it's wrong to deny people employment on the basis of their race than we do who believe that it would be wrong on the basis of sexual orientation or gender identity, then we can appeal to those cases that we all agree on in order to get that person to concede a general principle. A general principle is like a more general thing that explains this specific case. Okay? If we don't find a general principle in the case we're looking at, then we won't be able to bring anything back to attack or tackle the question that we want to deal with. All right, so we need a general principle. We need to find something about this case that's going to be applicable to other cases that we want to talk about.
So we want to ask, in this case, that's maybe a little bit less controversial, why is it wrong? Well, it's wrong, among other things, to deny individuals employment on the basis of their race, in part because it's wrong to discriminate against individuals on the basis of attributes that have nothing whatsoever to do with their ability to perform the job in question. If that's why it's wrong, then we can take that back to the other case that we want to talk about and see whether that same thing, the wrong-making feature, as philosophers sometimes say, of the first case is present in the second. And I think it is. This same general principle also seems to be relevant to cases of denying employment on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity. If there are no other morally relevant factors in these cases then, we can expect denying employment in these other cases to be wrong as well. Right? Because there might be, when we go from one situation to another, this is a great strategy and you always have to, you know, it's often useful to you, but you have to be careful, right? Because if you try to use the principle that you have found on the easy level, and you try to use that against the boss, you might be in trouble, and it might not work. And it's not going to work if there are other factors going on in the boss case that weren't present in the easy case that you went to to find your general principle. Okay, so in these other cases, there could be other factors. And this is true in any case where you're looking for an argument for analogy. Right? The way that that can go wrong, if you say, well, that's just like this, and this, blah, 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 the way that can go wrong is if that is not just like this. Okay. So, Marquis is going to argue from the wrongness of killing an adult human being to the wrongness of killing an unborn fetus. It therefore has to also be true that it is wrong to kill an adult human being. Right? It's, what, it's an unproblematic assumption, though. So there's no reason for him to try. Marquis could try to argue that it is wrong to kill an adult human being in the standard cases. He doesn't, and this is because it's just obvious that it's wrong, or less, sort of assuming less, being more epistemically responsible. It's also, we don't have to convince anybody of it. Hopefully, we don't have to convince anybody of it because everybody's right, but, you know, it's often good to say the least powerful thing that you have to say so that you're less likely to be exposed to objections. Um, so he doesn't do this. Again, lesson for writing, you don't need to explain everything, right? And I think in many cases that's obvious. But the skill is figuring out the hard cases. Do I need to put this in or not? You know, one of the primary questions that students ask when they're writing their paper is, do I need to put this in or not? And although I can answer that question, and sometimes that is a question that by answering it, you can actually help someone become a better writer, you can also see that you don't want students to become dependent on being provided answers to that question. So you try to be cagey. You try not to give a definite answer. Because that's the skill you need to learn. You're basically asking me, how should I write my paper? Um, anyway. Why is killing an adult human being wrong then? He gives several candid explanations, and I think he does this in order not only to rule out certain things, but in order to focus our attention on what he thinks is going to be where we're likely to find the wrongness of the killing. Okay, so he starts out, because it brutalizes the one doing the killing. So one reason why you might think killing an adult human being is wrong, and I don't think anyone does think this. I don't think anyone does. This is just there to show us that this kind of explanation maybe isn't so good. No. Brutalization means becoming inured to getting used to killing, and if this is bad, it's presumably bad only because killing is bad, and so getting used to it is bad. Therefore, we don't have an explanation of the wrongness. Our argument presupposes what it's trying to prove. 
if it is the case that brutalization is bad, probably that's because killing is bad and we need to prove that killing is bad. What this explanation is saying, by the way, because brutalizes isn't exactly a common term, um, is that killing is wrong because of an effect it has on the person doing the killing. So, for example, um, people who think that really realistic video games where you kill people, people who think that's wrong, one of the reasons they might think that is because they think it brutalizes the person engaging in the simulated killing, which means they're getting them used to killing, and now they don't think it's such a big deal. Okay. He's focusing our attention on this explanation because it's an explanation with a certain form. It's an explanation that finds the wrongness of the killing in the state that's acquired by the person who's doing the killing. So it's looking at the person doing the killing. And the video game example is a good uh, way to see this because no one's being killed. It's just a video game object. And so you can say, as people do about video games, well, you're not harming anyone. Well, people who think that you are are thinking that you're harming yourself. Uh, if they're right, you are. And if it's wrong to get used to killing, the ultimate point Marquis is making, that can only be because killing is wrong. I mean, there are other ways that you could argue here that are worth thinking about. It might be, for example, that actually um, the brutalization is bad, but not because killing is itself bad. It might be that brutalization it just makes you feel terrible about yourself. Maybe killing isn't wrong. And this is, of course, getting into hypotheticals because clearly killing is wrong. But maybe the thing that's being done to the agent doesn't depend on the fact that having that thing is going to make you more likely to do something that's wrong. Maybe it has a psychological effect. Um, that's one explanation. And it's an explanation, notably, notice this, that finds the thing that's going wrong in the psychology of the person who's doing the killing. And Marquis says, well, that's not a good explanation because it presupposes what it tries to prove. Because the only reason why brutalization can be bad is because it produces in a person a state that makes it more likely that they're going to be able to commit a certain kind of action in the future. And unless the action's bad, there's no problem. Second explanation. Because killing deprives others of the presence of loved ones, he says no. This doesn't explain why it's wrong to kill hermits, those who aren't loved, and those whose friends can make new friends easily. Right? So if the main reason, um, the reason, in a certain sense, why killing is wrong is that it deprives other people of the company of the person killed, that's not a great explanation because it doesn't hold in all cases. Okay, it doesn't hold in all cases. Um, because if that's what makes killing wrong in the standard case, well, a hermit is somebody who doesn't have any friends, and so the world might not even notice this individual is, is gone, and we still think killing is wrong. There are people who sadly aren't loved. I mean, I think it's, it's sad to say that because a lot of people falsely believe that there aren't, they aren't loved, and I think it's actually can be dangerous to, to matter of factly say this kind of thing because, you know, people, if you, if you point this fact out that there are people that aren't loved, people are going to think that maybe they're one of them. And more often than not, that's probably not true in their life. But there probably are people that aren't loved, either because uh, they don't have anyone around that they know, or because perhaps they've done something terrible, or perhaps their character is in some sense unlovable. There's one assumption here that's being made, and I actually don't think that it's problematic to make this assumption, but this is the kind of thing you need to think about when you're reading. Notice that Marquis does seem to make one questionable assumption that he doesn't point out. He appears to assume that there's going to be one primary reason that serves to make killing wrong in all cases where adult human beings are killed. Now, if you notice in what uh, I put on the screen, the excerpt, he does later talk about what primarily makes killing wrong. He uses this word, what primarily makes it wrong. This indicates that maybe he's willing to accept that there might be multiple reasons. 
notice that he doesn't always put this in the same way. I'm not saying he's conflicted on the point, but sometimes when people sometimes, you know, one time put a word in, but most of the time leave it out, it's because in their mind they have an issue, and that can be a sign of weakness. You can go after that when you're trying to figure out whether you agree with the, the paper. Um, so here, um, he doesn't argue that there's always going to be one thing. At one point, he says primarily, which suggests that, hey, maybe there can be cases where there are all kinds of other important factors that contribute to the wrongness, but this one's always the biggest. He does assume that the thing he's going to identify is going to be good enough to make every killing wrong. I'm not sure exactly what to say here. What do you think? That's the question. Anyway, let's go on. Oh. Next bit from Marquis. What primarily makes killing worse is neither its effect on the murderer nor its effect on the victim's friends and relatives, but its effect on the victim. This is what I was summarizing on the last slide. The loss of one's life is one of the greatest losses one can suffer. The loss of one's life deprives one of all the experiences, activities, projects, and enjoyments which would otherwise have constituted one's future. Therefore, killing someone is wrong primarily because the killing inflicts one of the greatest possible losses on the victim. So we have narrowed down our search for what makes killing wrong to something that is done to the victim as opposed to what is done to the killer or, and I should have pointed this out more explicitly, what is done to the people who love the victim. Right? We have three groups of people here. The killer, the one killed, the other people in the life of the one who's killed. You could add a fourth class. You could have the other people in the life of the killer. Right? Obviously, if you are a killer, that's going to be harming your family quite a bit. Right? Especially if the case gets found out and you are notorious. You've now ruined their lives in some cases. Anyway, um, he's putting the wrongness of the killing not in the one doing the killing or in the people who are friends and relatives of the one killed. He's putting it in the victim. Why? He thinks it's in the victim because the victim loses something. So the wrongness of killing is in the victim killed what? What is wrong about killing somebody? Well, he says, if you are killed, you suffer one of the greatest losses you can suffer. Why is that? Is it because it's just great to be alive no matter what? No, he doesn't say that, does he? He says it's wrong because it deprives one of all the experiences, activities, projects, and enjoyments which would otherwise have constituted one's future. Therefore, killing someone is wrong primarily because the killing inflicts one of the greatest possible losses on the victim. So, notice here, this is what I was trying to stress during the last slide, and he says this later on, we need to be careful when identifying the losses that make killing an adult human being wrong. Okay, And he's s s quite careful to say that as far as he goes, what makes killing an adult human being wrong isn't just the change of biological state from living to dead. He thinks that we might make the mistake of thinking that and thinking that what's wrong is just the biological change from living to dead. But he doesn't think that's the primary loss. He thinks the primary loss has to do with the other things you lose when you lose your life. The change in my biological state doesn't by itself make killing me wrong, perhaps. Maybe it does, but he's not focusing on that. He doesn't think it's most important. The effect of the loss of my biological life is what makes killing me wrong. And that is because that effect is the loss to me of all activities, projects, experiences, and enjoyments, which would otherwise have constituted my future personal life. Why is this important to say? Why is it so important for Marquis? that we not think that the thing that is wrong with killing an adult human being is just that we are taking them from a state of living to a state of not living. Why is it that just that change in biological state isn't the thing that's wrong? Why would anyone want 
to point this out? Well, one thing that might be at issue here is that what we say here might affect cases of euthanasia involving individuals in vegetative states. So somebody um, is, as we would say, a vegetable. There's not enough brain activity going on for us to satisfactorily conclude that they're consciously aware and it's never going to come back. Or maybe they are in states of severe unmitigated pain. We can't fix their pain. It's always there. It interferes with everything. That is a case where it really makes a difference what the thing that makes the killing wrong is. Because if the thing that makes killing wrong in the case of killing an adult human being, which is the uncontroversial case, if the thing that makes it wrong is just that you're taking something that is living and making it dead, then these cases are also going to have to be wrong. Because if you take someone who's in a vegetative state, in a coma, and you kill them, you've done that, right? You've changed their state from living to dead. So Marquis doesn't think that's the reason killing an adult human being is wrong. And one reason why he wants to point that out, I'm sure, is because he doesn't want his answer here to directly decide the question about whether euthanasia is wrong. You might also think that Marquis thinks it's okay to eat meat because it might be that the thing that he thinks is so valuable that makes killing wrong simply isn't present in the lives of many animals. All right, so look what he specified. Activities, projects, experiences, and enjoyments, which would otherwise have constituted my future personal life. Now, of course, animals have experiences. They probably also have activities, although really that depends a lot about what the word activity means. There is a very technical philosophical sense that I've talked about this paper, this book before, Hannah Arendt. It's, it's a continental philosopher that I think is really worth spending time with. Um, she has a book called The Human Condition. She talks about activity in a, in a way that she says uh, is Aristotelian, comes from Aristotle. Their activity means a specific kind of uh, behavior that allows you to express your values, right? So activity in this Aristotelian sense, or reportedly Aristotelian sense that Arendt picks up, uh, wouldn't include things like just getting enough food to eat, because that doesn't really express who you are. You can do it in certain ways that do. You can do a job that expresses who you are, or you can do it with finesse, whatever that means. Um, but you know, activity in this sense is going to be stuff like expressing your views politically in a way that has a real difference in the lives of others. Or, you know, building something, being creative, uh, doing a job where you're showing love for other people and improving their lives because that shows who you are. Okay. Do animals do that? This is obviously a controversial question. Do all animals do that? I know that you probably think that your dog or your cat does that. In the case of dogs, I think you're right. In the case of cats, the capacity for delusion, I think, is great in, in humanity. <laughs> but anyway, and I love cats too, but in the same way I might love a sweater. Um, you, you know, prove me right. That's not the subject of this class. Um, so maybe activities here covers animals. Maybe it doesn't. But there is a way for someone who says what Marquis says here to even avoid the conclusion that killing animals is wrong. Because if they don't have the things on this list in their futures, it wouldn't be wrong to kill them. And he's going to talk about this too. So, go on. He's told us that the thing that makes killing wrong is not the mere change from living to dead. It is rather the deprivation, the really theft, that the killer is doing to the killed because they are losing a valuable future. And the future is valuable, he says, in virtue of containing certain things, certain activities, projects, experiences, and enjoyments. And obviously, animals have experiences. They probably, I think, clearly have enjoyments. Cats enjoy uh, being scratched, for sure, um, unless they hate it and attack you every time you touch them, right? That's the thing about cats is that 
they come into the world in one way, and that's pretty much seems to be it. Uh, I'm gonna have the cat people on me if I keep this up. Um, projects, animals, I I think uncontroversially, I don't think a horse has a project, right? Like, what are you gonna do, horse? Well, I really wanna, you know, no. The horses, it's not just that they can't say it, right? They're not planning anything. Um, anyway, um, these activities, projects, experiences, and enjoyments are either valuable, Mark Hughes says, for their own sakes or are a means to something else that is valuable for its own sake. So what's he saying here? Well, if you've ever taken Aristotle's ethics, you'll notice here that it's pretty Aristotelian, right? This first sentence is way too clear to be found in Aristotle, but the for their own sakes language uh, is not. Uh, it's something you'd see right in Aristotle, right? So he's saying here, these activities, the projects, experiences, and enjoyments can be valuable in two ways. Maybe they're themselves valuable, or maybe they're valuable because they can allow other valuable things to happen. Maybe if you're never sick, you don't actually enjoy being healthy. So maybe even being sick can be in a weird way valuable. That would be a case of being valuable as a means to something else, but not valuable in your own sake. Anyway, that's a weird case, but I talk about this all the time, so sometimes it's fun to have a weird case. Some parts of my future are not valued by me now, but will come to be valued by me as I grow older and as my values and capacities change. When I am killed, I am deprived both of what I now value, which would have been part of my future personal life, but also what I would have come to value, what I would come to value. Therefore, when I die, he should have have come here. Uh, anyway, therefore, when I die, I am deprived of all of the value of my future. Inflicting this loss on me is ultimately what makes killing me wrong. This being the case, it would seem that what makes killing any adult human being prima facie seriously wrong is the loss of this other future. Okay, so he's telling us here why it is that being deprived of a future is wrong. So when you're killed, you are deprived of a future. Why is that wrong? Well, because being killed means that we lose all these other things, experiences, activities, projects, and enjoyments. Some of those are just valuable in themselves. This would be something like watching a nice sunset or raising a child or being in love or, you know, climbing the biggest mountain in the world and doing it with finesse, any of these things. Um, anything that you can enjoy, eating a nice hot dog. These kinds of things are valuable for their own sakes. There are other things that are valuable not for their own sakes, but for what they can make possible, like doing a job that you don't like, but that job allows you to raise the child, and you find the latter activity valuable in its own right. He's pointing out something different in the next sentence. Some parts of the future, of my future, aren't valued by me now, but will come to be valued by me as I grow older and as my values and capacities change. So he's pointing out here that in an ordinary human life, not talking about fetuses yet, there are certain changes that happen in the things that we value and the things that we can value. When I was in high school, I knew a few people who would say that they would never have children and, and really thought that they wouldn't. And I was always silent, curiously silent. But uh, they all got to a point, most of them, where they did want to have kids. And then they uh, had them, and they value that now. Um, so that's a case like what Marquis is talking about, a case where you wouldn't say now that you value the thing, and so you wouldn't actually mind being deprived, perhaps, right? If someone asks you at a certain age, is it okay if you never have kids? Is that, is that something you're interested in? They might actually say, no, nah, it's fine. I don't, I don't need that. Um, but, you know, you've got to be careful uh, because sometimes when you book a, a hotel room or something and, and then you don't take what they're offering you, and you say, oh, I don't want that. That's okay. And then you really come to regret um, not having a hot tub in your room. Um, <laughs> that's, that's a totally inappropriate example, um, but everyone has the things that make them happy, and it's not always the same. Um, so 
why is he talking about this? What is, what is the point? What do you think is the point? And this is what you should be asking yourself when you're reading actively. What's the point of this? Why is he going out of his way to say this? Well, there are things that he's saying you might not value at time A, but you might come to value them at time B. I want you to ask yourself, what does that have to do with abortion? Remember, he's talking about what makes killing wrong in general with a purpose, right? He wants to talk about it in this uncontroversial case, and he wants to get a lesson that will apply to abortion. So certain things that he is trying to point out, there's a reason, and it's because he's trying to identify things that are going to be useful when he wants to talk about abortion being wrong. So what's he looking for here? Well, he's interested in the fact that if you think about a fetus, one of the reasons we think it might be okay to kill a fetus, if we think it's okay or might be okay, and I certainly have a strong intuition in this direction, is that the fetus doesn't even know it's alive. And so the fetus doesn't value its future. It's not yet at the state where it can value anything. And this is importantly different, I think, from the state that Marquis is talking about in the case of an adult human being, because in that case, it is that the person just doesn't value this thing yet. They value something else instead, but their capacity for valuing is there. So he is probably interested in this because one of the big places that we're going to push back on his argument is probably going to be, well, wait a second. If killing an adult human being is wrong because you're depriving of something that, uh, them of something they value, well, are you doing that in the case of a fetus? Because a fetus, yes, it's true the fetus could value those things, but the fetus isn't able to value anything yet. Right? So this is, this is um, where we're going to push back. And so he wants to address this in the case that is uncontroversial. He wants to ask, well, is it true that the sense in which in that case, there are times when you don't currently value something, does the fact that you don't currently value it, does that mean that it's okay to kill you? Does that mean that there's nothing wrong with killing you? And obviously, he wants the answer there uh, to be, no, it doesn't. You know, and, and think about this. I might be so seriously depressed or psychotic that I want to die. I do not want to live. Does that mean it's okay for you to kill me? Does that mean it's okay for you to kill me without my consent? Okay, maybe you think that it's okay for you to kill me if I ask you and it's done through permissible channels. That's obviously a big moral issue, which we will talk about in this class. What about if you don't have my consent? You just see me on the street. You see, oh, he's very unhappy again. Game over, right? You can't, you can't kill me, right? It's still wrong. Um, that would be a case where it's still wrong, even though I don't currently value something. And he's going to want to say, and he says it here, that even though I don't value it now, I could come to value it. And that's why you can't take it away from me. Right? It's the possibility that I might come to value it in the future. I'm so depressed I don't value my life now, but I could. And this is doing a lot of the work in his paper. So I say it on the next slide, an important detail. Some parts of my future are not valued by me now, but will come to be valued by me as I grow older and my values and capacities change. It's important why. It shows that the value of what I'm losing by being killed now isn't contingent on my ability to recognize that value now. So there are things that it isn't right to take away with you, from you without your consent, even if you don't currently think of it as valuable. So like property rights, if someone has property and we recognize that this is their property, Maybe they've never used it, and maybe we all want to say, and maybe even believe, like, this person should have that thing taken away from them. And this is definitely more often than not the case when you're a kid, right? Because the great thing about being a child 
um, or watching kids is that they don't have much capacity for deception. And so some of them behave in ways that, of course, adults are going to behave, but we're going to be coy about it, right? So a child will sometimes show what we might call competitive self-esteem, meaning you want to have a certain kind of self-esteem that indicates that you are better than other people. You know, so kids will do this, right? You can see it very transparently because they can't hide it. We do it too, but we can hide it sometimes. Anyway, when it comes to property, there are kids who maybe uh, don't even want the toy. They just want it so you can't have it. And that is obviously the case with adults. We might feel inclined in those cases to say, well, Johnny doesn't get to have the toy because Johnny's not even using it and Johnny's never going to use it. And so why doesn't um, Jacqueline get a turn? Okay, or maybe she should just get the toy because Johnny's never touched it. That, in the case of property that's actually yours, we don't accept that as, as a good argument. I can't steal from you and say, ah, you weren't using it anyway. Now, we might actually think it's okay to steal in such cases, right? Legally, we don't think that's okay. And I think some of us morally in lots of cases, just because I don't currently know how to use my computer, you don't have the right to take it from me. That's the kind of thing that's being said here about whether or not you think your future is valuable. It's not about whether you now think it's valuable, just as it's not about whether you now want your computer or will figure out you haven't figured out how to use it yet, and maybe you will. It's about what will happen or might happen, okay? So it's not okay just because I find my future hopeless and meaningless now for others to kill me. Marquis would say, no, that's not okay. I might end up getting to a place where I don't feel this way about my future, and what matters is what might come to be valued by me, not what is valued be by me now. This is relevant to abortion because the fetus is in no position to value their future right now. The fetus doesn't even know it is alive, but the fetus may come to be able to value the future. Okay, so the thing that we need to ask ourselves here before we move on is whether the case he's looking at in which you can value something but you're not currently valuing it, whether that is importantly different or similar enough to the case of a fetus where the fetus can't value something or doesn't value it, rather, sorry, the fetus doesn't value something and can't, okay? This is a difference between the two cases, right? Because the fetus, it's not valuing anything. The adult human being is valuing X, but they're not valuing Y. So they don't want uh, maybe to go on living but they can. And now, of course, you can go down the road and say, okay, but what if the person actually can't? What if they are so severely depressed that they can't? Well, even in that case, if we think about it, that's not going to make it okay for me to kill them without their consent. We might think it's okay if we have a recognized medical condition that entails suffering and that in addition to being recognized, actually is suffering entailing because not everything that is identified as a medical condition, especially in fields like psychology, is. If you just look at the history of psychology and how young it is, there are cases where, you know, it's not just important that they recognize this. It's important that this is right, right? The judgment about whether you can or can't improve, a lot hangs on that. But anyway, I'm going down this road because I'm looking for cases that are going to help me understand what I think about the case of an ordinary adult who doesn't currently value their future. And I want to know why I think that. So I want to know what I think and why. And of course, I do think, and I think all of you think, you can't kill that person just because they don't currently value their future. And I also don't think that you can kill someone even if it's true to say that they can't come to value their future, like if they're severely depressed. What about the case of an infant 
where the infant can't, but the can't is slightly different. Right? It's, it's, it's almost, it's like temporally, the can't has a temporal dimension, meaning there's something to do with time that's, and there's something to do with time even in the cases where a person can come to um, change their values so that they can come to love their life again or at least appreciate it enough. Anyway, this is how you want to be thinking about this kind of thing. You want to look for cases that are kind of similar and kind of not similar and see how you feel about those. Because remember what we're doing here. We're looking at cases that we're kind of certain about or we have stronger feelings about, clearer feeling, and we're trying to figure out, well, why are those wrong if we think they're wrong? And we're going to help ourselves, hopefully, when it comes to the case of abortion where we're not so sure, we're going to help ourselves by finding out what's wrong in these easier cases, or at least cases that we're more certain about. So the next bit in Marquis' paper might be confusing to you. I imagine that if this is the first time you've read these words, you're going to have no clue what he's saying here. And what he's saying here has to do with ought from is. This is a place where it's not so much that this is an instance of bad writing on Marquis' part. It all depends on who his audience is, right? If his audiences are philosophers, you, you would hope that he's going to go to some, um, he would explain uh, only the things that they're not going to know. If his audience are undergrads who've never seen stuff, he should be specifying this, which is why I'm specifying it. So he says here something about ought from is, and unless you've seen this before, it's going to be impossible for you to understand exactly. You might have some sense just from what the words are of what might be at stake. And, you know, again, if you want, if I were you, I would pause this lecture now and think until you have either given up or figured out what do you think this means just from what the words say and what he's saying about them. What do you think? You need to practice doing this, practice seeing something that you don't understand, look at it a few times, and then try to figure it out. That's what philosophy reading often comes down to. How should this rudimentary theory of the wrongness of killing be evaluated? He's calling it a rudimentary theory of the wrongness of killing. What that means is that it has only the most basic elements. The rudiments, you get a piano book if you're playing piano, rudiments of piano or rudiments of music theory, just the stuff that is most necessary to have a basic understanding. Nothing above. So it's a rudimentary theory. It cannot be faulted for deriving an ought from an is, for it does not. So here he's saying, whatever theory we've developed, maybe it's right, maybe it's wrong, there's one thing it's not doing that people might think it's doing, and that's getting an ought from an is, deriving. Deriving an ought from an is. He says it doesn't. The analysis assumes that killing me or you, reader, is prima facie seriously wrong. The point of the analysis is to establish which natural property ultimately explains the wrongness of the killing, given that it is wrong. A natural property will ultimately explain the wrongness of killing only if, number one, the explanation fits with our intuitions about the matter, and number two, there is no other natural property that provides the basis for a better explanation of the wrongness of killing. So we just need to know what no ought from is means. Now, if, you're, if you try to actually uh, figure this out, if you've never seen it before, there's a few things that might help, right? One of them is, what does the word ought mean? Well, ought means something that you must do. You ought to do that means you, you should do that. What does it mean to say no ought from is? Well, he's saying here that if you want to make a claim that something ought to be done or ought not to be done, meaning a moral claim, something about how people should act, and you want to prove that claim, you can't do that if you only talk using sentences that have the word is and are in them. Okay? You can't get from just a description of the world two statements about what is right and what is wrong, what you ought to do, what you ought not to do, and so on. Okay? So that's what I mean when I say you can't construct a valid argument for a moral conclusion using only non-moral premises. If you have an argument you're giving and the conclusion is something about what we should do or not do, you have to include in your premises at least one premise that says something about what we should or shouldn't do. If your argument is just description of the world in the first part and your conclusion is, therefore, we should not kill dolphins, 
it's not going to be a valid argument. Now, it might be that the conclusion is true. I don't think we should kill dolphins. But if the argument doesn't have anything in it about values or morality, the claim that's being addressed here, the person who makes this claim thinks that that's a bad argument. It's not valid, meaning from the premises, you're not forced to agree if you believe the premises that the conclusion is true. This is what it means to say an argument is valid. An argument is valid if and only if the premises being true means the conclusion is true. If an argument isn't valid, that means that something's gone wrong. They haven't given you enough in the recipe to make the cake. The cake being the conclusion. So, no ought from is. This is a, a thing that you're often going to hear if you take contemporary philosophy classes or Hume or other early modern philosophers. Um, basically from Hume on, this is the way people put this point. Unless you have some view about what you should or shouldn't do, you can't prove a conclusion about what you should or shouldn't do. Okay, so you can see what this might mean if you think about arguments for this or of this sort that are relatively simple. So, you know, imagine I tell you, as a parent or authority figure of some kind, a gu guidance counselor or whatever, I tell you, look, Cigarettes cause cancer. Cancer often means that you die, and cancer is painful. If you are a young person that wants to smoke anyway, a thing that you might say is, so what? Okay. And what you're effectively saying there is no ought from is. You might not know it, but what you're saying to Mr. Russo, the guidance counselor, is, uh, so what? And that means no ought from is in a certain way. Because you're saying, okay, you've given me all this information about what cancer can do to me, but I don't care. Okay, that's a no ought from is kind of statement you're making. Because they've told you stuff that is indisputably factually true. That's the is. But they're trying to conclude something about the way you should behave. And you're saying, so what? Because you're saying, well, what you've given me isn't sufficient to establish the conclusion you're trying to establish, which is something about how I ought to behave. And it isn't sufficient because you don't get an ought from an is. Because it might be that you can concede that smoking causes cancer, etc., but maybe you really don't think, and this is actually the truth, you've examined this and you're not just deceiving yourself, which almost always going, is going on in such cases, Maybe you think uh, that you just don't care and you're right, okay? In which case, there's nothing that can be said about whether you should smoke or not based purely on the description. You need to have some values to plug in to get the ought out. So unless you put the ought in in the premises about the argument you're making, if you don't, you're not going to get it in the conclusion. That's what this means. So let's look at this with the uh, killing bit. So killing deprives a living being of a future. Therefore, killing is wrong, and we ought not to kill. This is an argument that, if this is all that's said, kind of assumes an ought from an is. I say kind of because, in some cases, we don't specify the ought part of the argument, but that's because it's so obvious. So, killing deprives a living being of the future. Therefore, killing is wrong, and we ought not to kill. The argument with just the premises that are given is invalid because to derive the conclusion that killing is wrong and we ought not to kill, we need something more than an is statement. So we have a statement that killing deprives a living being of a future. That's an is statement. It doesn't have the word is, but it's a description. It tells you how things are. Okay? I could say killing is an action that deprives a living being of a future, then I've got my is. Then my conclusion, therefore killing is wrong and we ought not to kill. The claim here is that unless you put in an extra step that is, it is wrong to kill a living being of a future. You don't get your conclusion from what you've started with. Okay. It's trying to derive the conclusion that killing is wrong and something we ought not to do. That's where the ought comes in again. 
from a premise that doesn't give us enough to work with to prove that. And the reason it doesn't is because unless you put an ought in there, there are ways that a person might concede your premises, might agree that they're true, while not accepting your conclusion. They can get off the bus, so to speak. That's what you're doing when you say, I don't care, so what? Right? I understand that, that I have a risk, a health risk associated with this behavior, but I don't care. Okay. Now, of course, in many cases, when people say the I don't care, we have good reason to think that they are lying to themselves or that they're just lying to us. Maybe they do, and it's clear that they do, but they're not accepting it because they want to be able to go on living in the way that they're living or having the attitude that they have. Okay. And so there are cases where the fact that we can't derive an ought from an is it doesn't mean that we don't actually think that the person as they are currently psychologically constituted shouldn't accept our conclusion. We actually think they should, and they would if they would actually be honest about what they think. Okay? So this is kind of what's going on here. The second argument is a argument that is okay by the no ought from is test. We can consider this a test. We're testing is there enough in the premises to see if the conclusion follows. Killing deprives a living being of a future. Depriving a moral being of a future is wrong and ought not to be done. Killing is wrong and ought not to be done. So now we have explicitly a statement that is an ought statement in my, our premises. Depriving a moral being of a future is wrong and ought not to be done. Now, if you just say depriving a moral being of a future is wrong, you don't need to say the ought part because ought is really included in the definition of wrong. If something's wrong, it's something you ought not to do. They're almost synonyms, okay? I'm just putting it in here to show where the ought is. Therefore, conclusion, killing is wrong and ought not to be done. So here in my premises, I have two. Killing deprives a living being of a future. That's the is. Depriving a moral being of a future is wrong, so it should be living being, and ought not to be done. Killing is wrong and ought not to be done. So there my premises give me enough. If someone accepts them, and they might not, they might deny either of these claims. The point is, though, that if they accept them, they have to accept the conclusion. So Marquis here is denying that he's committing this fallacy, the no ought from is fallacy. He's pointing out that his argument so far doesn't commit it. He's saying something here. He's saying, wait, I am including an ought premise in my premise set. It's just that I'm not going to argue for it. Okay? So he is going to include a premise about what you should or shouldn't do morally, what is right and what is wrong, because that's really what it means to say an ought. It's a statement about value or right or wrong, what has value or what would be right or wrong. That entails something about what you should or shouldn't do. That's the ought. So Marquis is not trying to derive an ought from a set of premises that only include an is, a bunch of ises, about what is the case. He is assuming that killing an adult human being is seriously wrong and trying to find the fact in virtue of which that is true and then take that explanation of the wrongness and apply it to another case. Okay. Now the explanation he's going to look for might be something that he would call a naturalistic fact, meaning it's going to be formulated in terms of a description about the world. But there is an ought claim attached to this. Okay. So he's saying, I'm assuming with everyone that killing a living adult human being is seriously immoral. And I want to know what it is about the case that makes that true. So the odd is already there, right? We've already kind of accepted the odd. And now we're just looking about, okay, this is a situation that includes an odd, and we've got that. We know it's there. We're trying to explain where it comes from. 
and it's going to be some fact about the situation that is the where it comes from in question. Okay, and that might look like a description because it will be. So killing might be wrong because you're doing it to something that has conscious awareness. So you're going to say the reason why killing is wrong is that adult human beings have consciousness and killing them derives them of consciousness. If that's our explanation, we're going to say that it's wrong to kill, say, a 10-month-old because a 10-month-old also has consciousness in some sense of the word. Of course, even consciousness is a very slippery word, as we'll see. But that's a description, right? The adult has consciousness and the infant has consciousness. That's a description. The point is that we are taking it from a situation that we've already admitted is wrong and saying, well, that's the thing that makes it wrong. So we haven't ever dropped ought statements from the table. And that's what he's trying to say here. So killing an adult is seriously wrong. We've accepted that. It is seriously wrong because it deprives the adult of a future that may come to be valued by this adult. Killing a fetus also deprives this fetus of a future that may come to be valued by this fetus. Therefore, killing a fetus is seriously wrong. So I've tried to formulate it here in a way that actually does include claims about wrongness in the premises, because that's what's happening. So next slide. The analysis assumes that killing me or you, reader, is prima facie seriously wrong. The point of the analysis is to establish which natural property ultimately explains the wrongness of the killing, given that it is wrong. A natural property will ultimately explain the wrongness of the killing only if, one, the explanation fits with our intuitions about the matter, and two, there is no other natural property that provides the basis for a better explanation of the wrongness of killing. This analysis rests on the intuition of what makes killing a particular human being or animal wrong is what it does to that particular human or animal. This last sentence, you can see, is again this assumption that what it is that makes killing an adult human being wrong is going to be something about what it does to the adult human being, not what it does to the killer or to people that might know the victim. It's a question of what does it do to the living being. So he's saying here that, yes, when he identifies the thing in virtue of which killing an adult human being is wrong, that's going to be, quote unquote, a natural property, meaning it's something that you can describe that doesn't make us think that you're talking about stuff that is supernatural. It doesn't necessarily mean a property that only you would, you know, that sort of property that a biologist would be talking about and only a biologist, perhaps, or mostly a biologist, because here the property is something about value and what values it is losing. But it's natural in the sense that we can all concede without believing in religious premises or believing in things that are controversial. We can all concede that a correct description of what happens in the case of an adult life is that an adult has plans, projects, experiences, and enjoyments and that those things are lost when killing happens. That's natural. It's a natural property because it's not an ethical property on the one hand, and it's not a supernatural property. But he's not doing an ought from an is because he is saying all the way along that killing an adult human being is wrong. Then he's saying, aha, well, killing an adult human being is wrong because adult human beings have these experiences. That's a natural property. It's a natural statement. We're not talking about souls. We're not saying killing is wrong because there's a soul. And so we're talking about a natural property, and he's going to talk about that. And that's going to be wrong, identified as wrong, because if that's what makes killing wrong, then it has to be itself wrong. It's wrong to kill. Why? Because you're depriving someone without their consent and without reason of their future. Now, he thinks that this is a good explanation of why killing an adult human being is wrong. Question, why is it a good explanation? Remember, just so we know, the explanation is killing an adult human being is wrong because it deprives this adult human being of a valuable future. Why is it a good one? Well, first, he says, this explanation explains why we regard killing as the worst of crimes. Killing is such an awful crime because it deprives the victim of everything valuable in the future. 
Stealing and assault are wrong because they deprive the victim of many valuable things going forward. Killing uh, deprives them of even more. So I've given a list here of different crimes. Stealing can deprive you of lots of things going forward and lots of things of value. And one of the things stealing deprives you of is future experiences, plans, projects, and so on. Someone could take my hammer that I need to continue building my building project. Someone can take my computer and now I can't enjoy that. And he's saying, look, all these things in these cases that I pointed out that are wrong, they're wrong because there's something that someone is being unjustly deprived of. Okay, someone has a right to something and they're being unjustly denied that right. Remember, if they have a right, they have a privilege, the privilege to have this future, and they have a claim against someone, and the claim's going to be that other people can't take that away from them without violating their right. It's not allowed. Stealing does that to one extent, and that's why stealing is a crime and wrong in many cases, or most cases. Assault does that in a different way. Because when you assault someone, first of all, you could physically injure them, and that might put a big damper on their projects. You might also cause them to experience such fear that you're depriving them of an ability to go out and about in public, or or by assaulting someone, you can cause them tremendous pain in the future, and the immediate and long-term future. So that would be the experiences bit. So that would be what's wrong with Stealing and assault, arguably, these are both good explanations of what's wrong here. And so, killing is worse than those things in all legal systems. You know, there are certain provisos because there are certain kinds of killing that certain legal systems recognize as allowable, like self-defense. But in general, killing is always, generally speaking, always in, always in general, kind of redundant, but in general, killing is worse. Most cases of killing are worse than most thefts and most assaults. So this is a good explanation of why it's wrong to kill someone because the principle that it specifies as making the killing wrong is arguably one that also helps explain these other cases. Okay, so there's something that makes stealing wrong and assault wrong, and that he's trying to suggest is this. And killing is wrong and recognized as more wrong in legal systems because it has the property that makes stealing, assault, etc. wrong, but it has it even more. And you can think of lots of crimes and think of why they might be wrong, and this is an explanation in some of these cases, quite a few of them, I think. And you immediately know how the explanation would go. Right? So imagine someone commits fraud. They call you on the phone and say, unless you pay me uh, all the money you have in your savings, um, I'm going to be, um, you know, in jail. And if you pay me, I can get all this money out of my company, and then I'll give you a billion dollars. Right? That's fraud. Why is that wrong? Well, you could say, well, it's wrong because someone's being deprived of future plans, projects, and experiences indirectly because they're being deprived of something that would enable them to have future experiences, plans, and projects. So that's why fraud is wrong. Okay? Maybe polluting the environment is wrong. It is. I mean, not in every case, because sometimes you can cause pollution and the environment can take care of it. Rivers, for example, um, have mechanisms to clean themselves. But obviously it is wrong in many cases. Why is that? Well, you could say that what you're doing is depriving future kids of possibilities for experience that you have. You could argue that. That's harder to do because you're not really depriving them of experience. You're just making their experience significantly worse. Okay. But anyway, if you think about lots of cases, you might find that you think that Marquis suggestion about what it is that makes various things wrong, you might find that it applies to a lot of cases that we think are wrong. So that's one reason to think this is a good explanation, okay? What you're looking for with a good explanation is 
explanatory power. I mean, there's plausibility, there's explanatory power, there's simplicity. That makes for a good explanation. So you want an explanation that explains more stuff rather than one that explains only a few things. You, of course, want an explanation that's likely to include only facts that are actually facts. It's not implausible. And you want something that's simple. You want something that's testable. You don't want an explanation that is, in principle, impossible to test. I mean, that doesn't make it a bad explanation, but it gives you reason to think that you're thinking it is an explanation leaves something to be desired, because you can't check either way. Um, so anyway, secondly, this is a good explanation why. Because it explains other cases that aren't crimes, but that we recognize are bad. Okay, so last class I talked about rights. And things like killing and stealing, they're violating rights, aren't they? Because a person has a privilege to their life, and they have a claim against everyone else that they not be killed. And people have privileges to their property. And if they do, they have claims against most people in most situations that other people don't take their property. Those are rights-based. If someone gets AIDS or cancer, in many cases, that's not a violation of their rights, right? Because unless someone knowingly behaved in ways that would have given them these conditions, they haven't been wronged by somebody. Okay, they just got cancer, and that's bad. It's not valuable. It's disvaluable. It's a bad thing. That's something we can say has value, and that, of course, because of this, we want to limit the number of cases of cancer in our society, and we want to uh, try to get rid of it if we can. We want to, you know, there are facts about the way cancer is that indicate that certain courses of action we take are the right courses of action to take, but if we don't, in such cases, we're not necessarily violating rights, okay? So, important takeaway, and I didn't think I get to, I don't think I got to this last lecture. Not everything that is bad involves a violation of rights. There's lots of stuff where it's bad, and in fact, you can say you should or shouldn't behave in this way, but you haven't violated rights. I think I talked about charity last time, right? Um, you might, it might be the right thing for you to do to give to charity, this is an example, I think, that came from the George Rainbolt paper. Um, but it's not because you would be violating rights if you didn't give to charity. Nobody has a particular right to your money. Okay, so the second point here is not that this fact about what you're doing when you're killing, it's not that this fact shows us why AIDS or cancer are wrong in the sense that wrong involves a violation of rights because you don't have a claim against anyone that would be being violated by your getting cancer. Now, of course, for people who believe in God, this is one thing that happens. If you believe in a monotheistic God, and people sometimes say this about the uh, Jewish God, the Israeli God, and then the Christian, the Muslim God inherits this, there is often an idea that this God is somewhat legalistic, meaning this God uh, is someone that is going to treat you justly, look after your rights. And if you believe in that kind of God, a God that can make contracts, a God that has expectations and responsibilities, you could see why someone getting cancer can be treated as a violation of rights. If anyone's read the book of Job or know what that is, it's a book that when I was in high school, people talked about a lot as an example of great poetry. If you wanted to read um, a text uh, from the Hebrew Bible, that would be especially um, poetic. And it's true. That is a book that treats God as someone who owes someone something and that can wrong a person. Right? And if you talk about the problem of evil in classes about God's existence, that's sometimes the attitude that's had. God owes it to you not to give you cancer when you're a child, an innocent child. Okay. Now, he's not talking in that way, so it wouldn't be right to say that someone getting cancer is wrong. It's just bad. Because unless there's a God, no one has violated anyone's rights. If someone gets cancer because a company knowingly put 
chemical causing carcinogenic chemicals in water supplies and that caused the cancer, then that person has been wronged when they got cancer. The point here though is just that these things are bad. And his claim about the value that is lost when you lose a future in virtue of losing your ability to have experiences, plans, or projects in that future, his claim about that also allows him to provide an easy, sensible explanation to the question, why is it bad when people get AIDS or cancer? Same reason. It's just in this other case, there, generally speaking, isn't going to be a claim about rights or what is right or wrong. So this is a good explanation. Again, why it explains a lot of stuff. It's also plausible. We have, when we hear this thing about why killing is wrong, I think most of us probably think, yeah, that's plausible. That sounds like what might be the problem. Okay. Let's see. I have gone a little bit over time again. I don't want to do that. So I want you, and the lecture is ending, I want you to think about something for your section, okay? And I want you to come prepared to discuss this issue. The question I want you to think about is what are reasons why the explanation of why killing is wrong that Marquis has given, what are some reasons that you think that might be a bad explanation? Now, you don't need to come in with explanations that you think definitely, determinately, with 100% certainty are going to show that Marquis is wrong, okay? All that you need to do is say something that strikes you as plausible. Maybe you have a not quite fully developed idea. That can be your contribution, okay? So maybe you want to say, well, I've noticed that this case is like this, and maybe that shows that his explanation is wrong. Maybe there are cases where the stuff that he's talking about are, is present, and it isn't wrong. And so it, it can't be the case that his explanation of the wrongness in the cases he's interested in is the right one. Because if something's an explanation, it should always serve to explain the thing that it's explaining, unless there's something else that, you know, overrides its normal explanatory power. I want you to think about whether you think his explanation of what is wrong with killing an adult human being, do you think that's a good one or not? Okay? Um, anyway, have a great weekend. Bye-bye.